working? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming today. My name is Hazan Daoud. I'm a graduate student here at the Physics Department and the president of the Egyptian Physics Association. Uh, today, I'm glad to have the opportunity to welcome you to this invited distinguished lecture titled Exploring Volatile and Planetary Surfaces Using Radar Observations by Dr. Hassan Hati. This event surface and subsurface characterization methods. He is a member of several NASA and European Space Agency missions using radar, using radar remote sensing to probe water on the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hassan So, uh, good evening everyone. I would like to thank you for being here and I would like to thank the Egy Egyptian Student Association and the University of, of Toronto for having me here. And the biggest question you might have before we start the lecture, why the Egyptian Student Association is bringing you a guy to talk about water on Mars? Might be a good question. You would not expect someone from Egypt to, to, to brief you about how we can find water on Mars and on the solar system. And I will tell you why and how this happened. Uh, I was in the age of many of you here as a, as a PhD student, as a master student in France. And my master thesis was on something nobody cares about. It was about finding water in desert environment. Um, I, I was born in Libya, it's a poor place. I'm citizen of Egypt, it's another poor place, and I'm trying to find the essential, which is water. And so, and that's the type of scholarship I have. That was in 1998. So in, two, in 2000, when I started my PhD, they started the Mars exp exploration program. And the biggest theme in Mars exploration was how to look for water. And the only c c c c competencies that they could find around are those people who are, have the expertise to look for water in the, the, the desert. And that's how I jumped the journey for now 20 years on looking for water on asteroids, on comets, on the moon, on Mars, on the icy moon of Jupiter, everywhere except the deserts on Earth. And why? Why? This is, is something that we need to change because it is more precious and more scientifically respected to find water on the solar system then unfortunately find it for desert environment. 
And who can change this? You. So if we don't have PhD students working on water research, we will never advance water uh, uh, in hazardous environment. So I'm affiliated with these three places, the University of Southern California, JPL, and um, NASA. So you probably know very well JPL and NASA, and less USC, but uh, uh, if you know the first person who worked on, who worked on the moon, Neil Armstrong was a master student when he worked on the moon. He was a master in aerospace and mechanical engineering when he worked on the moon in six months uh, after he returned, he got his master's degree from USC. So USC is a big player in space exploration. So water and the solar system and volatiles are in everywhere, everybody we know in the solar system has volatiles and water to some extent in different format between gas and ice. Uh, it is not only on the liquid phase of our planet, it's also on the liquid phase of other places. The big question we have is that to understand the water distribution in the solar system, we have to use techniques that to probe in the subsurface of these environments. And why? Because with the exception of, uh, uh, of the Earth, the water is in the subsurface of most of planetary environments, including the asteroids and comets. So just this presentation is gonna be very simplistic. There would be no equation, it would be very simple and the main objective uh, of it would be to introduce you to radar technique. So basically, what is radar subsurface uh, imaging? The technique is an active system. So basically, if you send a radio wave and you get a reflection, each time you send the wave, you get a reflection at the surface, and one part will go in the subsurface, and then will go another part of the surface, and you will have a reflection of the wave at each moment you see a dielectric difference. Uh, if you look to your cell phone, your cell phone is working because the radar waves of your communications service is going through these walls. So that's how we use ra radar for imaging. So radar is relatively new. The first radar exploration of any surface in the solar system started in 1940 with a ranging to, to the moon, estimating the distance between us and the moon and it started the Earth observation in 1978, and it started the, the, in geophysics, the ground penetrating radar in, nine, in, in 1942. So the technique is, re, is relatively new one in, uh, uh, in mapping. You have three types of radar system, the ground penetrating radar, which we, we use uh, uh, on the ground, and you have the, the version, which is the uh, 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 air forces, and then you have the uh, orbital system. So many of you, uh, they are familiar with these ones, but very few are familiar with the orbital ones because they are relatively new. So you have two types of radar uh, exploration of the subsurface, the imaging and the sounding. The imaging one, they generate the, the uh, uh, images at very high frequency, and they are, they are like the synthetic aperture <coughs> the radar system, and the sounding one, which will, will use the lower frequency and will go to a few hundreds of meters in penetration. To show you the example of how radar is able to do sub subsurface imaging. So this is an image, 100 kilometers by 60 kilometers. It's an optical uh, lensite image of the Sahara in Egypt. And when you look to this image, you don't find any evidence of water at all. But what is beneath, few meter beneath the sand sheets we see here? If you look to the radar uh, images by the ALOS uh, 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 satellite, this is what you see, radar, optical. And below the sand sheets, few meter deep, you see this huge drainage of, of flow that are now, they do not have any water, and they are the uh, remnants of the pluvial uh, area which occurred in the south of Egypt between the border of Sudan and Egypt. And so you see these flow, they are uh, 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 eight kilometer wide, so this is really s substantial flows. And you see uh, all these tectonic features here which 
they are the conduit of the groundwater system we have today in these areas. And amazingly, when you look at the surface of these areas, you don't see any evidence of that, any topographic evidence of these flows. So then there become the big question, why we use radar? Because radar is the difference between what you see at the surface and what you see inside the, the surface you are looking at. So it gives you a more accurate look to the environmental and geological uh, uh, past of the body you're looking at. So what is the place that this is of interest? Of course it's on Mars. And why it is on Mars? Because Mars is basically, in simplistic words, is the sister planet of the Earth. If we understand how this planet has shifted from a blue planet to a yellow planet, we can understand the future of our own planet. And how we can see this? We can only see this if we understand the water evolution on Mars and, and if we understand how the climate of Mars have changed over the last few million years. So uh, uh, very similar to the, the hazard, on Mars we have a lot of sand sheets and a lot of sand deposits of us, which make a very good place for radar because we can see some of the traces of the fluvial activity on Mars in the subsurface, just in the same way we see in the Sahara in Egypt as I've shown. So these are the surface images of Mars, and everywhere you look, it's the deserts, and it's covered with the dust. And beneath this dust is the history, is the fluvial history of Mars you're looking for. So you, have, you, you may have seen uh, these flows that was observed with a mock camera on Mars, and they all suggested that Mars may have had a recent uh, fluvial activity at the surface. So if Mars had had a fluvial activity at the surface, was Mars one day a blue planet? That's the big question we're trying to answer. So to answer this question, you need to find water on Mars to, see, to explore if Mars was one day similar to our planet. And to find water on Mars, you know that you will not be able to find it at the surface. So we designed three uh, instruments to look for water in the subsurface of Mars using radar technique. So the first one is the, uh, is the Mars' instrument, which is on board the um, Mahasic Press uh, uh, Orbiter. The second one is the Sharad instrument, which is on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And the third one, which is the Wisdom Road uh, uh, radar, which is on board the ExoMars rover. And it will be launched to Mars in 2020. So the difference between these three instruments is the frequencies that they are using. So it's basically the penetration capability and the vertical resolution. So this one, it has, it's using the frequency from one to five megahertz. And the penetration is from 500 meters to, to 5,000 meters. The Sharad instrument is looking to the shallow subsurface from 50 meters to 1,000 meters. And the wisdom instrument is looking to ice and water in the first few meters. So these are the three experiments. Right now, two of them are active on Mars, and one of them is, is in its way to Mars in 2020. Uh, and the three of them are looking to understand the past fluvial and water activity on Mars. So the way it works, it's very easy. You have the, the, the radar system in orbit. You send the radio wave. You have a reflection at the surface. And then you have a propagation in the subsurface. And each, when you have the, uh, the, the aquifer, you have a reflection due to the dielectric contrast between the saturated and the, and the unsaturated layer. And the penetration of these radar, uh, uh, radar wave is controlled by this equation. It's basically, it's a property of the electric and magnetic properties of the subsurface of Mars. To show you some of the example of the data we have uh, from the Sharad instrument. So the profile here is over at the area. It's called uh, 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 Amazonis. It's, it's an equatorial area on Mars. So you have the surface reflection here and the subsurface reflection on what is potentially ice is here in this area. It's ice or a lava flow. And so that is the profile we see. And we used 
the decay analysis of the radar signal to understand also the composition of the subsurface. For, for instance, we use it uh, uh, over the rafted plates in an area is called uh, Hatabasca to understand the composition of the of the plates we see here, if they are pitch uh, 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 ice or they are volcanic origin. So, and we saw that these plates, they are uh, uh, of volcanic origin. The same thing, we look to the sedimentation inside the large basin of Mars to try to understand if these bases, they are uh, uh, from the uh, remnants uh, of, a, of a, a global ocean, or they are a fluvial deposit from the highland to the lowlands here, and also in the case here, uh, if they are uh, filled with uh, low viscosity lava flows. Again, our big question is to understand if Mars has a global ocean or not. And these are some of the results that we show you. We find uh, by doing the radar tomography, we, we find in the Amazonist uh, area, an area with high conductivity of radar, it can be associated to a salt lake, it can be associated to Chile's deposit in this area. We are still investigating the origin of these plates. So, I remember, again, when I started, as I mentioned, the PhD in 1998. So people, when they look to radar, because it's new and we never had a radar mission, they say, we can't look to the composition of the subsurface with radar. This is not scientific. It's not science. In 2008, we made the cover of Science Magazine. And so, and so 10 years after, we were able to map the subsurface of the polar layer deposit uh, of Mars and see the stratigraphy few kilometer deep. And we had for the first time ever the stratigraphy of the polar layer deposit of Mars. And the most impressive result here is that we can understand the sequence of the formation of these big ice deposits on Mars and the time scale it needed for water to exist on Mars to form these features, and that was only made possible by the radar technique, which was new. So from the, the success we had on Mars, we started to, to look for, for water uh, underneath the uh, icy moons, and uh, uh, basically, uh, the first interest is to look for ice on Europa, is to, to look for the global ocean of ice underneath the surface of Europa. So uh, uh, as you know, Europa is an icy moon. And the te tectonic feature we see at the surface, they, they put the hypothesis of a global ocean few kilometers deep, so it's a nine kilometer deep uh, 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 below the thick layer of warm mm -hmm. ice. So the Jovian uh, icy moon, uh, so we have a lot of the uh, observation uh, uh, from the Galileo mission, and you can see all these uh, uh, ice edges that you see here, here, which imply the continuous movement of the ice uh, 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 over the ocean in this way. So you have uh, an aquifer, so the surface is here, and you have a few kilometers uh, uh, of ice, and then you have the layer of the warm ice, and you have these brackish aquifers that are moving the ice above and making these structures happen. So we do so uh, so we do simulation using FD TV to uh, understand the propagation of the radar signal in the subsurface of Jovian moon to understand how, what are the requirements to, de to detect these aquifers uh, 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 in uh, icy moons. I will not go in detail, but
But basically, this is, this is, is all about understanding the physics of the ice, the electrical physics of the ice, and the propagation of the radio wave in the subsurface of these uh, uh, ice environment. And, and here we, we, we can see the, the results of the simulation. So this is basically the, the, the depth from zero to two kilometers. And this is, is the magnitude of the reflected uh, uh, echo. And these are the losses in the signal and the, refle and the reflection uh, we see using different models. And we can see that we are uh, able to map the existence of uh, brackish water fences few kilometers deep with radar. So the third places that we look for water in the solar system and for ice, it's comets. And comets are fascinating study. They are the biggest transporter of uh, uh, ice in the solar system. And uh, the comet we, we, we looked at is with the Rosetta mission is Comet 67E. And uh, basically the big question we have is what are the enrichment in the uh, uh, ice and in organic material we have in these comets. So who heard about the Rosetta mission? Okay, very good. So comets are super important. This is the size of 67P compared to the city of Los Angeles. So 67P is about four kilometers in diameter. It is very, very dark. So let me give you this way. If you are at night in Los Angeles or in Toronto and the comet is positioned in this place, you won't see it. It's so dark that it's not affecting anything. And this is why we need radar to observe these bodies in the solar system, because we cannot see them before they become active when they approach the sun. So again, we return to when I was in your age, I was a master student, and the Rosetta mission in 1998, it was just a proposal over a nap. It was just an idea, so I survived it with the Rosetta mission from 1998 to 2018, 20 years, with. With, uh, with one mission, and it's, a, it's an amazing thing because what you're doing right now in your master, hopefully you will see the results of these ideas. What may look for you today as unfeasible, it's a crazy, is actually what happened in the future. So the Rosetta mission, I will talk more about it, it's really the Cadillac of the space mission. So for instance, if I compare the size of the Rosetta mission, so the, Ro the Rosetta spacecraft, when it did deploy the solar panel, it is 50 meter long. So it's a half of a football field. It has 21 instruments on board. If I compare it to the mm, mm, Mars Express, it has basically, or the Dawn mission, it has five or four instruments on board. So this mission has four times on average more instrument on board. And on the spacecraft you see here the small mm, lander here, and this lander is supposed to land on the comet. And Rosetta is named uh, uh, after the R Rosetta stone in Egypt, and the Philae lander is named after, after a small island in Egypt, which both of them have the origin of the human history. This is why the mission was named after them. So this is the scenario we thought it would happen. So we thought that we will be in a close approach of the comet, and then we will land the small lander, and the surface is smooth, and the comet is small enough, a few hundred of meters, and everything will go very nice. And so that was uh, what was expected before 2014. So when we approached the comet, we started to get surprises. Now remember, Rosetta was launched in 2000, 2004, and it reached 67 P in 2014, 10 years, uh, uh, 10 years in space. So your machine, your spacecraft is 10 years old. 
It has been in the high radiation environment, in the cold environment, and now it is supposed to land on an unknown body of the solar system. And that's what happened. One day before the landing, uh, 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 NASA and ESA decided to go forward for the landing, even thought that our landing mechanism was not, was not working. So the anchoring system was not working. And we, did, we started an eight hour of landing with uncontrolled landing. And these are the real uh, uh, image uh, of the descent uh, of the lander from the main spacecraft and the surprises when we reach the comet. So this is, is the, the, the cameras of the navigation on board the lander that the comet is not smooth. We are landing in this. And uh, so we started the descent and that's the spot of the descent. So as you might have seen this in the images, people were very happy. It went all around the globe. We landed on a comet. It's the first ever landing and remember, if landing on Mars is a challenge, landing on Mars happened in seven minutes, and Mars is not far away from us. The comet is 740 million kilometers away, and you launch a spacecraft that is 10 years old. When you land on Mars, your spacecraft is six months old. So it's a totally different mindset. So that's what has been reported, but the instrument we are working on, the radar instrument, this is, is the echo we received from the radar from the radar instrument, which I work with, uh, I work on, and I will explain what it does. So we started to see that the echo is coming from the spacecraft, is going ups and down, ups and down, as function of time. What does that mean? That the lander is not static. The lander actually is bouncing on the surface. And here is the landing, so it is here, and then it is here, and then it is somewhere here, and then <coughs> it disappears. So for a few tens of minutes, you have a spacecraft at the size of this, uh, uh, of the table, bumping on the surface of a comet, which you don't know, you're discovering the images. And now it started the biggest rescue operation. You have 11 instruments on board of this lander. They are working and operating and sending you the data, but you don't know where it is at the land. And now you have to see the marriage between physics electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, astronomy, everything, how they fused to be together to find this lander. And that's what I will show you. So before, I just wanted to tell you what I'm doing on the mission. So the, I'm working on the concert instrument. And the concert instrument is an instrument designed to understand the inner structure of comets. What comets are made of? What type of ice it is made inside? What is the structural heterogeneity inside of these comets? So one day, if we have an encounter with these bodies, so we know what is the inner feature in inside of them, so we can see how they form and how potentially we can protect the planet from a wrong debris with that. So basically, in a, uh, in a simple word, we try to understand the electrical properties of the comets, and from that deduce the type of ice and the type of uh, uh, of organic material and inclusion we have in that ice. So again, why understanding the radar properties of comets is important? Because about two-thirds of the observations made of comets from the Earth are made with Earth-based radar. And radar only see the electrical properties. It doesn't see the optical properties. So if you don't know the electrical properties, of these uh, comets, you can totally misestimate their size, their dimension, their dynamic. So how that instrument work? So the instrument work is very easy. The lander is here, and the orbiter is here. It's going around. And we send a ra the radio wave from here, and it is re received on board the, the, the orbiter. And then the orbiter will send the radio wave, and it is received by the lander. So this is how it works, and I'll show you this nice video. So we send a, a, a 90 megahertz wave, and it go across the body of the comet to the main spacecraft location, and from that you are able to make a tomography of the comet, trying to understand what is its inner 
properties. So, um, yeah. So th this is, is a simulation made with FDTD. So we landed on the head of the comet here, and these are the the signal we received across the head. We were not able to see the, the signal across the body of the comet, just across the head before the, 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 uh, uh, we lose the, the signal as we go through the head. So amazingly what we did is that we used the signal from the constant, from the constant uh, uh, instrument as a GPS to locate the lost lander. It's basically by, by understanding the reflection we get in orbit, we can use a triangular analysis and locate the comet, uh, the lander. Uh, so most importantly, to do that, you have to understand the electrical properties of the comet as a function of the porosity, mineralogy, the dust to ice ratio, temperature. So we have to do a lot of lab measurements. And now we have the, the uh, 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 inverse question. We assume the dielectric properties and we know the location of the uh, uh, orbiter, and we have to find the location of the lander. Ro the Rosetta mission have totally changed the way we see the surface of the comet. It's basically, we realize that the comet is much r r r r tougher environment than we previously thought. And that has a lot of important application to understand the age of the comet. So the younger the comet is, the rougher the comets are. So if you see the comet is very smooth, this is mean it has been reworked by many uh, uh, encounter uh, 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 with the sun. So these are the green images we have at the surface of the comet, and you can uh, and and basically these are the different roughness level you have at the surface of the comet for the DHF scale, S-band scale, X-band. So we use the X and uh, 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 the band and the S using the Earth-based observation to monitor this comet. And we know now that they are extremely tough and that changed a lot of our uh, data analysis on the Earth. So Using the radar observation also, we were able to understand the shallow subsurface of the comet. So why it is important? Because we have future mission that will bring back the samples from the comet. And basically, in easy words, you have a surface which is desiccated from the ice. It is very rich in harbor. And you have the ice few uh, tens of meters deep underneath that layer. Uh, 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 of carbon. So we also we, we, we tried it to understand what are the type of inclusions we see in the ice uh, and uh, basically we see that the comet ice inclusion can be the, from, the, from the dielectric inversion of the radar signal we see that the type of inclusion we have is more of organic material and that's very important because it means that comets they are the biggest player in transporting organic material in our solar system. So to say it in the easier words, if we exist in this room, most probably a lot of the organic material that compose our existence comes from comets. And that's how it looks like the dielectric model of the comet. The only thing I want you to remember from that, that the comets are extremely heterogeneous from the electrical point of view. They're not homogeneous, which is mean that when we observe them from the Earth-based radar, they can change their properties as function of the large dielectric changes uh, at the surface. So that's very important because that is our way to understand the characteristics of these bodies. I would not go to a lot of the signal analysis, but uh, one of the things that we find, and these are the real uh, uh, images uh, on the surface of the comet, we find these uh, 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 cruise feature, 
that you see here. And these, we thought that we wanted to understand, are these continuous in the subsurface of the comet? Are these the primordial uh, uh, rocks making the comets or not? And we find these are thermal contraction feature uh, at the surface of the comet, and they're not continuous in the subsurface, which means that we think that comets are really very homogeneous. So the final thing that th this is how we located the spacecraft, as I mentioned, through the calculations. And this is the area we located the spacecraft from using the radar at uh, triangulation, and we published the results in science in 2015. And one few, few days before the mission end, we went to, uh, to, mm, mm, to look to the lander in the area we located uh, through the triangulation, and we find it, it is here. You see the lander? So this is the lander, was located after two years of search on a comet. And basically, to do that, we have to use the images, the very high resolution, resolution images of the space craft as it was descending to hit the surface of the comet. So we were able to locate the lander 720 million kilometer away and, and hence making the analysis of the data that we got uh, in, a, in a useful way because now we know uh, what does this data mean as function of the material we have at the surface. So the Museum of uh, Berlin, of natural, the Berlin Museum of Natural Science, they put the team in Rosetta, who was in charge of locating the lander in, a, in, an, in an armor panel, and they compared the advances in the Rosetta mission to what uh, Galileo and other people have done, and I was happy to be here. And I, I never expected that uh, someone would recognize 20 years of the work that all the mission people we've been working on, but that's for the grad students who are here. What is, this was my, 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 my PhD thesis and my master's thesis, to look for water in desert environment. And ultimately, it helped to find the spacecraft, it's lost on a comet. So we have also another mission, the Dawn mission, where we look for ice on two uh, bodies of the solar system, on two small uh, asteroids, two big asteroids, actually, Vesta uh, and, and Ceres. And we used the radar technique to try to see if the roughness we observed and Vesta and Ceres are correlated with the hydrogen uh, distribution at the surface of these two, uh, two uh, asteroids. They are actually huge. So this one is 500 kilometer, and this one is 900 kilometers. So these are, they are considered as protoplanets. I don't go in detail a lot of how we did the dielectric map, but basically what we did is that we used the communication antenna uh, of the Dawn mission to, to receive the signal who were hit during the occultation by the surface of Vesta, and we, we measured the strength of this echo uh, using the gold stone uh, on the Earth, and that's basically what we get. So this is the signal before the occultation, this is the power you received, the spectrum, and this is the direct signal from the spacecraft, and this is as we enter the occultation, so this is the reflection on the echo, this is the, the surface echo reflection on Vesta, and this is the occultation, and this is the surface reflection echo you, you get at the exit of occultation. And basically what we did is that we did a correlation between the roughness at the surface and the hydrogen the distribution in the subsurface. And what we were able to show in this, that everywhere we see smooth surface, uh, like this one, we have correlation with ice, which is mean that there is the ground ice on the surface uh, of Vesta. So we are not talking about few uh, 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 ice, few centimeter deep, we're talking about massive amount of ground ice on the surface of Vesta. And that was, uh, so a few m m months ago, the paper we have, it was in Nature, and we were, we were selected by the Nature uh, uh, editor to go to the highlights 
and that is the amazing woman. Or that was that with my student in the Hezabel. So it's once again we were able to find water on comets, on asteroids, on Mars, on the moon. And uh, 20 years after, we started to design a mission to find water on the Earth. And so, and I started to pick up the work I promised to do in my PhD thesis 20 years after, to design a spacecraft that will look for aquifers on the surface of the Earth. And, and I, I am the PI of the, of the mission, and this is a mission in formulation in JPL, and it will map the thickness of the ice sheets and the depth to the aquifer and desert environment. So we design it, the parameters of the missions, and we have a testing of the pr prototype of the instrument uh, in Kuwait. And, and basically, you can see uh, the profile here is six kilometer long, and the surface echo is here. And 50 meter deep, you see the aquifer is the line you see here. So I wanted to show you this figure at the end because this is what I was supposed to do in my PhD. I was supposed to help build the technology to look for water in desert environments. And we have to go to Mars, the moon, the icy moons, Jupiter, Uranus, uh, asteroids and comets to do this. And uh, again, don't look to your PhD in a light way. Look at it really that something that can, ch that can change the, the world. And I, s I would say to the, to the f f f faculty, are here. I wanted to thank you uh, for taking the students from international, uh, uh, from many places. When I started my PhD, uh, it seems a topic that has no future, nobody would care about. Finding water in the desert, who cares about the desert? But it was feasible after 20 years to build this mission and use the, the, the advances we got in, in Mars on the moon to do this. So take your research seriously and many thanks for being here. Thank you. Actually, we have a paper which we published three years ago about using the radio noise as a transmitter on uh, for icy moons for Jupiter, and uh, we use a co correlation technique of the noise to try to see subsurface signal uh, from the subsurface of Europa using that that noise. So we have a passive mode on board the Juice radar, which is designed by the European Space Agency, and will ha it will have a passive mode that will look. To, to compare Jupiter noise as the no with the noise reflected on the subsurface of Europa. Okay, it's very important. So because Water on, uh, water on Mars, it tells you that we're not the first potentially livable environment in the solar system. We might be the second generation. There was other livable environments in the solar system. That's an easy world. But finding water on comets and asteroids is super important because they transport these ice and water by impact to other bodies of the solar system. So let's assume you have a, you have a comet that hit the surface of the moon, a big comet that hit the surface of the moon. All the ice in that comet will turn to water and vapor around the moon. It will make the gas environment around the moon, it will make an atmosphere around the moon. It's actually, we see that on Cirrus. Cirrus is an asteroid that has an atmosphere, probably been brought to it by impact. So the, it's understanding ice and these small bodies of the solar system is our understanding how we transform the condition of life in our solar system. Of course, that is the aim of the project. The aim of the project 
is to understand the thickness of the ice sheets in the polar areas of the Earth, how the thickness is changing, and understand the depth to groundwater on the Earth. So the first one will help us to, to better have a, a better constrain the ambiguity on understanding sea cover rise. And the second one will help us understand how hazards are responding to climatic stresses. Because right now, many people, they think that climate change is only happening in the poles. It's happened in the deserts too, through the impact on the groundwater change. And that uh, the mission is a joint uh, mission between uh, JPL and the Italian Space Agency and the Kuwait Institute for, for Science and Research and the Qatar Foundation is also uh, joining the program. No, the comets are far away from us. But the comets have, I mean, if you compare a human being to the dinosaur, for instance, dinosaurs are stronger than us, are bigger than us, and yet they disappear because of an impact, because of an asteroid impact. So if we don't understand the, the comets and, and uh, uh, asteroids, and how they evolve in the solar system, we are a threat. So this is a very important thing to study because our existence could be related to one impact. Excellent question. Yes, because the thermal condition at the surface of Mars, you have a low, uh, uh, the pressure at the surface is very low, the temperature is very low, that you cannot have liquid water at the surface. So the first reason why we started to look very deep is that we think that there is a global aquifer on Mars that is the, the, the remnant of the wet Mars. So that's what we started to look at with the Mars Express, with Marsis. And then we started to look if there is shallow water. And this one requires a landing. The wisdom instrument, the, the shallowest one, requires a, require a lander. And to send the lander is not, we need to know which are the areas that have shallow aquifer. So to this day, we did not map an aquifer on Mars. And there are many reasons why we think. We think that, that maybe these instruments were designed to look, let's say, for a hundred, few hundred meters meter deep to kilometers. Maybe the water, the water is deeper than that. So that's basically why we, we are looking for, with the wisdom radar, for shallow evidence of groundwater on Mars. So it's, it, it's basically the minerals in the subsurface who are being brought uh, uh, at the surface by uh, vertical flow through the fracture. This one? Like in the the other the this? No, the concept of the the, the the concept? Oh, the space mission. The concept of the space? No, no, the concept. Oh, the concept, yeah. So you have two sessions, right? Yes. From the subsurface. Okay, it's a very good question. So the first radar sees dielectric difference, so difference in the electrical property. So we di we differentiate between these echo by the time they arrive. The first echo arrive very early in the time. The later we see the echoes, the deeper these echoes they are. That's, so we look we look to the to the normalized the strength of the echo, and we look to the time the delay we get the echo. 
So how we invert the dielectric is basically by comparing the surface reflection to the strength of the surface reflection to the strength of the uh, subsurface one. The inversion is not unique, is model dependent, but it does constrain the ambiguity uh, with also the use, the use of the topographic data. So we can, there are some, some feature like the rapid plate here, for instance. We know the thickness of these feature from the data, uh, uh, from the, the, the laser data. And then we see the echo that is, that is coming from the top and the bottom. So we can make an estimation of the electrical properties using these, these techniques. 